Okay, well, let's just continue then in, in the series that we've been doing in Hebrews chapter 11, which is called Faith People. And this morning we're coming to the fourth in that series, um, which I've entitled Faith That Laughs at Impossibilities. Okay, so let's just read one verse this morning out of Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 11 says, By faith... Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Amen. Now, some people refer to Hebrews chapter 11 as God's great gallery of men of faith or God's great catalogue of men of faith. But it's not just about men. There are several women in this chapter, women of faith. Sarah is the first one mentioned. We read about the faith of Rahab, which we'll look at in time. We read also about the faith of Moses' parents, plural, mother and father. We read also about those women who through faith received their dead raised back to life again. So there are many women of faith in this chapter and we're looking this morning at Sarah and I like the way it says there that Sarah had her own faith we need to understand that she was not an appendage of Abraham didn't go along for the ride okay it says by faith Sarah herself herself received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. You see, God gave a promise to Abraham that he would be the heir of this great seed. And through this seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But you know, it needed the faith of Sarah also for this promise to be fulfilled. Amen? They were in this together. They, they walked together. Abraham had his faith. Sarah had her faith. And we're going to look at that this morning. You know, sometimes uh, Sarah can be portrayed as one who was of doubt, whereas Abraham was the great man of faith. But when we look, and we have looked at, at, at the life of Abraham, we see that his faith was, was a process. He, he went from faith, uh, from doubt to faith. In fact, you know, I looked just recently at that, that verse which says that he staggered not. He staggered not at the, 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 the promise, uh, uh, he staggered not at the circumstances, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. But we know what that means is that eventually, eventually he came to that place where he did not stagger. The word stagger means to, to waver, to go from one side to another, like a drunkard person. That's the meaning. You know, you see someone who's drunk and, and you don't know whether they're going to stand up. It looks like they're going down. You know, they go from one side to another. And, and sometimes we are like that. In fact, our whole growth in grace is like that. We have our doubts, but then God brings us into that place of faith. Sometimes we lean this way, sometimes we lean that way. Amen? You ask, how's so-and-so going? Oh, they're up and down. No, they're not up and down, they're side to side. They're from faith to doubt, then back to faith again. And, and that's how it is, and that's how it was with Abraham, and that's how it was with Sarah also. And we're going to just look at the development of her faith, the growth of her faith, the progress of her faith. Now, the first thing that we read about Sarah is that she was barren. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. It says that even before they left the land of Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land that God promised. It says that she was barren. And, 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 and you know, uh, God gave Abraham a promise that he was going to bless him and bless his seed. But Sarah, his wife, was barren. And, and so then you, we see that um, uh, as time went on, Abraham looked at this. Can we just have the, the sound up a little bit more, please? Thank you. As time went on, um, Abraham looked at this and he could see that his wife was barren, so he took his eyes off the promise and he pinned his hope on Eliezer, just down a little bit, on Eliezer, who was the household slave. 
or servant, okay, because he was born in his household, so officially he was uh, a descendant of Abraham, he belonged to Abraham, and so Abraham said, well, this is the one that God is going to bless, not one from my own body, but one that is officially born in my household, and therefore I can claim him to be an heir. But God came to him and said, behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body will be your heir. So you see how it, it is when we, we're walking in faith. We need the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And, and God sees when we're doubting and he brings a word, reminds us of the word of God. Amen? And we come back to the word. We believe in the word. We stand on the word and our faith is strengthened. But of course, the years rolled on and still nothing was happening. Sarah was barren. And so she then, in her moment of unbelief, had another plan. We know about that plan. Let's read about it. Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her, by proxy. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. So this time we see it was Sarah that was weak in faith and she influenced Abraham and they did this thing together which was a big mistake. Caused them a lot of pain and a lot of problems. Well, time went on again. And, and we see that God came to Abraham again. God came to him again in a moment of weakness. And he said, we read this, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall no longer call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And he's one that's brought into the covenant, you know. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. That's very clear, isn't it? I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. And look at this. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now, some people actually preach that this was a laugh of faith it was like wow this is so amazing is this going to happen to me that's not how it was God came to him he said you will have a son by her but he was still in unbelief and how do you know that because the next verse says and Abraham said to God oh that Ishmael might live before you you see he still pinned his hopes on the son of Hagar you know, let this promise be fulfilled any way that I can handle. I can't handle you saying to me that I, a hundred years of age, am going to be uh, able to, to give birth to a, a son through my wife who's 90 years of age and is barren anyway. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, I love this, no. Wow. I love it when God says, no. No. We're doing this my way. <laughs> but this is where faith, I believe, rose in Abraham. At this point, God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. You know what Isaac means? No? Bible students, where are you? Hello? Hello? Isaac means laughter. <laughs> and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Isn't that wonderful? So at that point, Abraham gets it. At that point, Abraham has faith in what God is going to do. God is firm, God is clear, God is absolutely uh, unnegotiable as far as this is concerned. This is what I'm going to do, it's going to be done my way, and it's going to be done by the power of God. Amen? Okay, 
Then shortly after that, we read in the next chapter that Abraham and Sarah were at home and their home was a tent, remember? They dwelt in tents. And uh, not, not, not that they were intense. I'm not saying they were intense, but they dwelt <laughs> in tents. And uh, they had a visit. They had three visitors come to see them. Okay? The Bible says they were men, but then we discover later on that they weren't men. They, they came in the form of men. Who were they? Well, we understand later on that one of them was God. God, the second person of the Godhead, God the Son. Okay, he's called the Lord. Uh, God sometimes revealed himself, uh, and every time he did reveal himself, it was always through the second person of the Trinity. God never revealed himself by the first person of the Trinity. No man has seen God at any time. Amen? And so this is what we call a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Jesus coming in the flesh, appearing as a man to Abraham. What about the other two? Well, we know that they were angels because in the next chapter, which is chapter 19 now, we see that these are the two angels that were sent down to Sodom and Gomorrah to bring judgment upon those cities. And so these three visitors, and, and, and in fact, um, uh, Abraham and, and Sarah did not know. They thought they were humans. They thought they were men just coming. And, and they invited them for a meal. They were very hospitable. And uh, you know, it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, do not be forgetful to entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unawares without realizing it. And, and all commentators say that's a reference to this, what we're looking at now. And so these three heavenly beings, one was Jesus, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. The other two were angels, and they come to visit Abraham and Sarah. They're invited into their home for a meal. When did they realize that they were not men, that it was the Lord? When did they realize? Well, as they're talking, this is when Abraham gets the revelation. It says, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? Well, that was a giveaway. Because how did they know his wife's name was Sarah? Where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. Now the tent, you've got to understand, it wasn't like a little tent you crawl in. This is a tent they lived in. It's a big, like a big room. Had a flap the other side. They prepared meals and did things like that. And, and so visibly she could not be seen. And he, says, he, he said, uh, here in the tent. And he said, that's the Lord, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now, when, when the Lord said that, Abraham knew it was the Lord because only one person had ever promised him he would have a son. Several times God came to him and promised this seed. And he said, now the time has come. This time next year, the appointed time, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. At that point, Abraham knew it was the Lord. What about Sarah? Well, let's read on. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. Okay, not outwardly, within herself, saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? It's at this point that Sarah knows it's the Lord. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Remember, she's the other side of the flap that she can't visibly see, and it was within her heart. But all of a sudden, God, who is omniscient, could see right into her heart and knew what was going on. Why did Sarah laugh, saying, surely, uh, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Wow. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. He said, no again, no. <laughs> but you did laugh, amen. And, and so at that point, 
When Sarah knew that these visitors could see through the tent flap, the tent door, see into her heart, know her very thoughts, she knew it was the Lord. And the Bible says that by faith, Sarah received strength to conceive. Wow. She received strength. Why? Because the Lord said, is anything too hard for the Lord? See, this is the whole thing of faith, friends. It's faith in God. Up until they, that point, they were trying to work it all out in their own strength. Amen. How can I do it? My wife is barren. What about Eliezer? Oh, that Eliezer might. Let's try to work this out. Let's see how we can do it. Then Sarah comes along. Here's Hagar. Let's do it this way. They come to the point where not only is she barren, but they're both well beyond the age of childbearing. It's not going to happen by them. And so God gets the focus from them to you. It's not about you. When you have faith, it's not faith in you. Amen? It's faith in God who will come into the midst of your weakness and do a miracle. Amen? Is anything too hard for the Lord? For the Lord who created all things. For the Lord who spoke and a universe came into being. For the Lord who created this body. Amen? Is anything too hard from him who is omnipotent, who has revealed himself to Sarah and to Abraham as being omniscient, who knows all things, who has all power, who is infinite? Is anything too hard for the Lord? That's when she had faith to conceive. Why? The Bible says because she judged him faithful who promised. See, many people make promises. It's not a promise that gives you faith. You've got to look at the one who's promised. I know many people make promises and you think, yeah, you roll your eyes because of their track record, <laughs> because of their history. Amen? You know, <laughs> there, there are psychics and, 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 and people that make forecasts. There are people that try to predict the result of a match, you know, like the Blues are going to win, yeah, you know. <laughs> and in the end you can't believe them anymore because there's so many broken promises. But is anything too hard for the Lord? Amen. She judged him faithful who promised. And she, she received strength to conceive. Hallelujah. Friends, you know, one of the things that really try our faith is we, 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 we fail to understand God's timing. We think that faith instantly gets results. We need to read our Bibles because that's not the, the case. The Bible says that we are th those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Faith is tried. It takes time to try faith. And, and the whole thing about this promise is that this child would come at the appointed time. You know, um, the Bible says this, My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Amen? There's a set time. It's not going to come any earlier. In fact, when God promised Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees that he was going to have a seed that would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. That was decades, friends, I'm going to put it like 30 years before its fulfillment. That faith was tested. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and eventually it's coming up, but, but you can't fast forward it by fasting to bring it on quick to make it happen. God is sovereign. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His timing is not our timing. God is not in a hurry, so much as a hurry as you think he is. It's us that's in a hurry, and we think God is in a hurry. 
You know, it's funny. I mean, you, I, I, you, you laugh at these things, but um, <laughs> I was with somebody the other day and uh, this person really wants to go home to be with the Lord, you know, lived a good life, lived at the end of her life. And, and, and she was complaining to someone who's not a Christian. Why doesn't the Lord take me? Why doesn't the Lord take me home? I'm, I want to go home. And this person, being not a Christian, said, well, you know, he's very busy. <laughs> he's got a lot of things on his mind. Think of how many people there are in the world. You know, he's very busy. Don't put any more pressure on him. <laughs> You've got to laugh, haven't you? Amen. But God has a timing, and he kept reminding Abraham of this timing. At the appointed time, he said again, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. For Sarah conceived and bore an Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. You know, it's going to happen in God's time. Not before, not after. God is not late, but he's not in a hurry. Amen. You know, when sin came into the world, God promised through the seed of the woman, the serpent's head would be bruised. You know, all the, all the prophets affirmed that promise. And the years rolled on, the centuries rolled on. And all the prophets spoke of his coming. They were faithful in proclaiming it. They waited, they waited, they waited, and then the Old Testament canon closed. After Malachi, there was silence for 400 years. No word from God. They were all waiting for the promised Messiah. You know what the Bible says? When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. That, that term, the fullness of time, when you look at it in the Greek, it's a metaphorical term. It means, it's like, you know, the sand dropping down in the hourglass. And God has an exact moment when that, that, that final piece of grain of sand drops into the lower portion of the hourglass. The time is fulfilled. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son. Praise God. Let's just go back a little bit here. But the vision is yet for an appointed time. You see, that prophecy was given in response to Habakkuk, who is a prophet, who was a prophet, and he was so confused about what God was allowing to go on in his time. And the fact that God wasn't acting and injustice was carried, being carried out and the, the wicked were prosperous, the righteous were suffering, blah, blah, blah. And he was making his complaint to God. Aren't you going to do something? And then God revealed what he was going to do. In fact, it blew him away. It caused him to tremble. It caused him just to shake and, and just to be amazed at what God was going to do. But God said this, but the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak. And it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. In other words, it won't be any later than God's appointed time. Has God promised you something? And maybe you thought, he hasn't fulfilled it. He will fulfill it in his appointed time. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Behold, says God, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. When you are a believer, friends, you can wait for God. You can wait on God's time. When you say you have faith, you don't panic when it's not happening, when others think it should be happening. Because you can wait. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Amen. Will not become impatient. Amen? Well, it happened. By faith, Sarah received strength to conceive in her old age because she judged him faithful 
who had promised. And you know, when God does something, He does a good job. He does a perfect job. He doesn't just get us over the line somehow, some way. He does it with glory. When God gave her strength to conceive, He also gave her strength to carry that child nine months. He gave us strength to go through the labor and to, to give birth to Isaac. He gave strength for her to, to nurse that child until it was weaned from her. When God does a job, he does it perfectly. When God rejuvenated the body of Abraham, he didn't just have the ability to give birth, as it were, to, to Isaac. But you know, Isaac lived to be a mature man, and then Sarah passed away. Abraham remarried and had six other sons. Man, that's, I don't, that beats Viagra. <laughs> Lord, give me some of that. <laughs> okay, we'll have a prayer line afterwards, I think, for those that would like, like the blessing of Abraham on you. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. You know, the thing is that God caused them to laugh. First of all, they laughed at God, and it was a cynical laugh. It was a mocking laugh, really. Let's be honest. Huh. That kind of laugh. <laughs> is this going to happen? Look at our situation. It was a, 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 a laugh that poured scorn upon the promise of God. But look at what Sarah said afterwards. Sarah said, God has caused me, uh, has made me laugh, and all who will hear will laugh with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what I say. Isaac means laughter. I, I love humor, but you've got to understand humor. And one of the things about humor is the key is the unexpected. You know, people, when, when you tell them a joke, they laugh because they weren't expecting the punchline. It's something different to what they expected, right? That's the key to humor. You ever heard somebody who tries to tell a joke and halfway through you already know what the punchline is going to be? And it's not funny by the time they get there, you can't think. But that's the whole thing. And this is so unexpected. Abraham, Sarah, have a, you know, Sarah's pregnant with a son. Sarah's given birth to a son. Get out of here. You've got to be joking. God has made me laugh. And all who hear will laugh with me. Amen. Praise God. I love this. This, is, this was written after re the return from the captivity. You remember when, when Israel went into captivity, what was it they said? You know, come and sing us one of the Lord's songs. You know, by the rivers of Babylon where we sat down. There we wept as we remembered Zion. And they said, sing us one of the Lord's songs. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They had no song in them. They were in Babylon. They were, you know, they lost their inheritance, Israel. But then two generations later, God did the amazing thing, the most unexpected thing. God miraculously worked, raised up a leader who worked for them to go back to their own land and gave them everything they needed, gave warnings to the enemies around them. Don't you touch them. In fact, you give them everything they need. You help them. Just an absolute miracle. This is what this psalm is about. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. I mean, that's a dream that God would do this. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. See, they were just like Sarah and Abraham. It was like they were as good as dead in that land of captivity. But God, but God, is anything too hard for the Lord? Hallelujah. And when it happened, he said, we were like those who laughed. It was the laugh of faith, the laugh that laughs at impossibilities. You know, I've never shared this with you, and uh, 
Um, I share it with you now at the risk of <laughs> getting run out of town afterwards. You know, when we started the church at, at um, Chugan, you know, we just started. God told us to go and start a church there. We were very clear about that. God spoke to us. We didn't know who was going to come with us. And, and, and a group of, can I say, not so young people <laughs> came and joined us. And that was our nucleus. And, and you, know, you know what happens. Like attracts like. And so we had other not so young people come. And for, for a, quite a while, our congregation was not so young. And, and you know, people would sort of uh, make disparaging remarks about that. And uh, it took a while before we started seeing a few younger people and younger families coming in. And, and by the time we got there, then the Lord told us to come here and start a church here. And do you know what happened? That group of not so young people <laughs> followed us down here. I felt like turning around saying, go home, go, <laughs> leave me alone. But you know, after time, when I look back at our time in New Beginnings and see what God has done with a bunch of, oh, I didn't say geriatrics. <laughs> with a bunch of, of not-so-young people. It's amazing. Friends, honestly, it is amazing. It causes me to laugh, the laugh of faith. Only God could do this. You know, when, when I look at what God has done in Africa, the, the amount of money that has been raised so that we could go over there each year and, and the conferences were paid for and, and you, know, you know that our budget was, on average, twenty-five to 30000 really, when, when all up every year to run these conferences. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pastors had their lives and ministries transformed as they got the revelation of the grace of God. And they, 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 you know, we've started these schools of ministry. I think we've got about 70 now, and I don't know, I've lost track of the number, but about 70 which you have provided all the TVs, the DVD players, the, the, you know, when we needed gen set or, or what do you call them, um, the, the power Generator. generators, all that sort of stuff, all been provided by this group here. And an orphanage, and a church built, and we've helped build another church or, or contribute towards it, and, 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 and it goes on and on. I don't know. You know what? I don't know how much would have been given through this church. But you know, let's backtrack. We could have had, and this is in no way having a dig at the younger generation, but let's just say we had a, a younger congregation who were not committed, who were not prayerful and supportive financially in all the vision that God had given to us. Amen? God does it His way and in His time. And, and when He takes that which is seemingly weak and even despised by some to bring glory and honour to His own name. Amen. And in the end we look back and we laugh. See what God has done. The Lord has done great things for them. Amen? Amen. 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 So God took Sarai, full of unbelief in the beginning, and turned her into a great woman of faith who received strength to conceive in her old age because she judged him faithful who had promised. You know, what I like about Hebrews chapter 11 is that in the Old Testament you see all the blemishes of the saints, all their weaknesses, all their faults, all their failings. You don't read anything of that in chapter 11. You know, it speaks about Jacob. Jacob was a manipulator, a schemer. We try to walk, work everything out by conniving and outsmarting other people. 
mainly his relatives. You don't read that in Hebrews 11. We read about Moses, who was a murderer. No mention of that. We read about David, an adulterer. He's there, but there's no mention of that. We read about Samson, a womanizer, a man with an independent spirit who just strong-willed, did everything his way. No mention of that. It's by faith, by faith, by faith. And here we have Sarah. No mention of her doubt in the beginning. Her laughing at the promises of God. No mention of that. Why is that? Because God takes everything, friends, and he brings it through the cross. He brings it through the cross where all our sins are forgiven. He gives us his righteousness and he presents us as he does all these saints in Hebrews 11, righteous in his sight. And that's how he does with you and I. You know, you look back and the, the devil would continuously remind you of your past and your failings. God does not do that. He brings it all through the cross. It's all been dealt with there. And we come out in his righteousness. Now we are a people of faith. The only response to grace is faith. Amen. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. Praise God. One other thing I want to mention as I close, and it's this, that, you know, I mentioned earlier that Abraham and Sarah were together. We need to see them as together. Though they had their own personal faith, they both needed to have their own individual faith, they worked together. Without them working together, it was not going to happen. And, and when you come over into the New Testament epistles, you find that Peter uses this couple as an example of marriage. You know, in marriage, we learn to work together. It talks about responsibility. I'm just going to just share a few verses with you here. In, in 1 Peter chapter 3, first of all, it's talking about the beauty of the woman. It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. It doesn't say you, you can't do those things. It says don't let it merely be those things. That's not the sum total of beauty. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are. Now, when you think about this, God spoke to Abraham. It was a major thing for him and especially for Sarah to uproot from their homeland, their home, their relatives, and to go to a land that they didn't even know where it was, where they were going, to leave everything behind. God spoke to Abraham and, and Sarah, in a beautiful way, submitted to that leadership of Abraham, believing that he'd heard right. And you know, he made mistakes, he, he wavered and so on, but, but all the way through, she was beautiful in her loyalty and her submission to Abraham. And he goes on to say, husbands, okay, husbands likewise dwell with them, that is your wives, with understanding, giving honour to the wife as to the weaker vessel. That's not a, a term of disparagement. It's just saying your wife is different. She's, she's you know, there's a difference between a male and a female. That, that seems to be lost today, but there is a difference. Amen? And, and God says to husbands, understand your wives. They're not the same as you. They think differently. They feel differently. They, they respond differently. They're wired differently. And our role is a challenge to, to seek to understand them so that we can love them and, and, and be the best for them and give them the best. Amen? It goes on to say, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Amen? Amen? Now, I know that for some of you, some of these things are outside of your power. To, 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 to be at one, as it were, with your partner. But where it is possible, 
you know? We need to honor one another. We need to realize that we are one flesh. God has brought us together to, to walk together, to serve Him together, to pray together, and, and, and as we are one in that sense, by the grace of God, our prayers will not be hindered. Now, as I say, I know that's not possible for everyone because um, you can do your part, but it takes two. But as much as lies in you, be at one with your partner. Amen. Uh, do what God asks of you, and as you pray together, there's a power in your prayers. Now, as we close this morning, Sarah was barren. On top of that, she was now past the age of childbearing. But God allowed her to come to that point. It was his appointed time. It was the point of her most abject weakness and, and, and a dire need. She just had to take her eyes off herself and put them on God. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at your circumstances and look to the Lord. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Judge him faithful who has promised. And God will give you strength to conceive what he wants you to give birth to and to bring forth in this world. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for the word of God. And we just thank you, Lord God, that you come to us even in our doubt, not with condemnation, but to strengthen our faith with the word of God, to encourage us, to undergird us, to take us, Lord, from that position of staggering and wavering to standing firm in the faith, to being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Teach us, Lord, to judge you faithful, to not look to our circumstances, but to look to you who has promised and to stand solid in the word of God and the promise of God, giving glory to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.